Foreign Excellence Webinar Series, which is sponsored by Black Hills IP and the SLW Institute. Black Hills IP is a U.S.-based service provider offering IP docketing, paralegal, analytics, and annuity services. The SLW Institute is an educational group created by the Schwegman Lundberg Wissner firm, which aims to provide insightful and useful information to the IP community. For this webinar series, we have brought together experts from the Schwegman firm, Black Hills IP, and their respective clients and customers to talk about strategies and best practices for patenting in key non-US countries. The Foreign Excellence webinar series is free. This is the first of about 20 webinars that will be included in this series. The schedule and registration information for the first 10 of these webinars is listed on our website. To register for future programs, go to the tab for educational resources on the Black Hills IP website, which is www.blackhillsip.com. The webinar that we are presenting today will cover China. We have allowed time for questions at the end of the program, but questions may be submitted throughout the program using the question button on the right-hand side of your browser window. You can submit a question at any time during the presentation, and it will be held in a queue until the end of the program. Before we begin, I want to let people know that Black Hills IP is presenting a free full-day docketing seminar in Washington, D.C. On, on November 8th. This is an advanced docketing seminar that is intended for people with, I'd say, three or more years' experience in patent docketing and will be beneficial even for your most experienced docketers in your organization, even the 20, 30-year docketers. To register for the seminar in D.C., go to the Educational Resources tab again on our website and then click on Seminars under the Docketing Excellence heading. We'd love it if you'd share this information with those in your docketing department. The presenters for today's program are myself, Rachel Hook, and Greg Stark. I'm Ann McCracken, the president of Black Hills IP. I'm a patent attorney with 20 years experience in patent prosecution. I was a partner at the Schweigman firm for 10 years, and I was also a full-time law professor and directed the patent prosecution program at Franklin Pierce Law Center, which is now University of New Hampshire, for five years. Rachel, can you tell the audience about yourself? Yes, certainly. Um, it does seem a bit funny that I, I'm speaking on China when I'm actually from Australia, but I'm a partner of FB Rice. Um, we, we're an IP firm which operates in Australia, New Zealand, and Southeast Asia. And uh, while we don't have offices in China ourselves, we've, we've got some very close ties with Chinese partners. And in fact, one of my roles in the firm is to head our China operations. And largely, this came about um, 10 years ago when more and more of our clients started to ask about the merits of filing an application in China, and we realized there was a need to educate both our staff and clients. So I, I do travel to China regularly, and uh, I'm, I'm keeping uh, on my toes because the IP seems constantly changing and evolving. Great. Thank you, Rachel. Greg, can you introduce yourself? Of course. My name is Greg Stark. I'm a partner with uh, Schweigman, Lundberg, and Wissner. Uh, I've been practicing for about 10 years. Uh, primary focus of my practice is uh, patent procurement uh, and client counseling in the areas of due diligence, post-grant review, uh, and freedom to operate type uh, activities. Uh, I spend a, a fair bit of time uh, working very closely with foreign associates um, as, as I um, you know, have a number of large clients, large and medium-sized clients that do a, quite a bit of uh, foreign filing. Um, and China, of course, has been, you know, a, a big area of focus, particularly over the last few years. Great. Thank you, Rachel and Greg, for both uh, participating in the program today. Today we're going to talk about uh, patenting in China. I will start by going through some data and looking at some filing trends. Then Rachel will talk about patent acquisition and due diligence. And finally, Greg will address patent enforcement 
in China. A number of the charts that I'm about to present come from WIPO, and I've included on each slide the, the source, so if you want to go look at them yourselves, you can. It's important to understand the terminology on these charts because it's a little bit confusing. This is the definition of the terms that are used that comes directly from WIPO. As you would expect, resident is used for filings made by applicants at their home office. So in this case, resident would be the Chinese applicants on the charts that we're about to look at. But I was a little confused at first by the term of abroad and non-resident. In the WIPO database, non-resident is used to identify an, uh, an instance where an office receives an application filed by a foreigner. So in this case, if we're wanting to see how many U.S. applicants are filing in China, that would be the bars or the numbers marked non-resident on the data that I'm about to show you. And then abroad would indicate how many Chinese applicants are filing outside of China, so abroad is relative to the, the home office. So let's take a look at the first one. This is application filing trends since um, 2001. I was a little surprised to see that initially in 2001, the non-residents, so the non-Chinese applicants, outnumbered the resident applicants. Not by a lot, but in 2001, there were a little over 33,000 non-resident applications filed in China and 30,000 resident applications in China. In 2001 that, or 2002, that trend continued, although the gap got a little, a little smaller. And finally, in 2003, the resident filings outnumbered the non-Chinese resident filings. Where it really started to be a noticeable difference was in 2006. In 2006, the Chinese Patent Office had 122,000 applications filed by Chinese applicants and 88,000 filed by non-residents. That resident number continued to jump noticeably, as you can see from the, the bars on this chart, while the non-resident filings have remained fairly level for the last uh, 10 years. In 2015, there were close to a million applications filed by Chinese residents and only 133,000 applications filed by non-residents. So I was surprised to see how that uh, stayed fairly level over the last years, the last 10 years for the non-resident applications. The next chart is also from WIPO and it tells us what technology areas those application filings are in. The um, largest groups are in what I would call computer and electronics. Uh, the if you look at the light blue colored pie slice, the orange pie slice, and then kind of the gray pie slice, those are about 7% of the filings for digital communications. That's the light blue. The orange is 7% of the filings for electrical machinery, apparatus, and energy. And the gray is about 6% of the filings for computer technology. There's a very big chunk that WIPO has in the category of other, that's almost 50% of the filings. But of the areas where we've got a defined technology area, I would lump those top three together and say that you've got roughly about 20% of the overall filings being in the computer and electronics field, and that's the largest category that we see uh, being filed there. Next, I have some data on the patents granted year by year from 2001 to 2015 from the Chinese Patent Office. I was even more surprised by this data than I was the filings. And this particular data set, again, starting in 2001, there were more patents being granted to non-residents than there were to Chinese residents. And that trend continues all the way through 2008. So in 2001, there were a little over 5,000 patents granted to Chinese residents 
And in comparison, twice as many, uh, almost 11,000 patents were granted to non-residents. Like I said, that continued through 2008. Even in 2008, the non-residents had 47,000 patents granted to them, and the Chinese residents had not quite as many. They had 46,000 patents granted to them. So it wasn't until 2009 where the grant statistics show that things flipped and the residents uh, outnumbered the non-residents when it comes to the number of patents granted per year. Now, the other thing that I think is interesting on this chart is if you look from 2009 to 2015, once the non or once the residents um, overtook the non-residents for patent grants, then they really skyrocketed up. You look at how much that changed from 2008 to 2015. We went from uh, 46,000 patents granted to Chinese residents in 2008 up to uh, let's see, about 260,000 patents granted to Chinese residents in 2015. Now, what I think is surprising here as well is the uh, increase, or the, the non-resident grants did not increase proportionally. In fact, the non-resident grants leveled off and in some cases took a step backwards over that period of time. So in 2008, like I said, there were about 47,000 patents granted to non-residents. By 2015, that had only increased to 95,000, which is a much um, slower rate of increase than the resident ones. So I found that uh, interesting as well. <clears throat> Next, this data shows the overall number of patents in force in China, regardless of who they were granted to. And clearly, we can see a dramatic increase in the number of patents in force in China over the period from 2007 to 2015. In 2007, there were 2, uh, 270,000 patents in force. And by 2015, there were almost 1.5 million patents in force. And I need to step back here because when Rachel's talks in a couple of minutes, she's going to talk about the difference between an invention patent and a utility model. And I forgot to mention that the data that I am looking at is just for invention patents. So this number of patents in force for 2015 is just the number of invention patents in force. And here in just a minute, Rachel will talk about what the difference between those two are. The final slide that I have with data is the top applicants for 2016. The main takeaway from this is you scan the list of companies there is that these are all, um, I think these are all Chinese companies. And certainly the largest applicant really overshadows the rest in a dramatic proportion. So the largest applicant in the Chinese Patent Office in this data is the State Grid Corporation of China. They deal with building and supplying power grids, and they had 15,000 patents grant in 2016. The next one down has only 3,000, or I'm sorry, 3,600 patents granted in 2016, and that's the China Petroleum. Uh, company. So both companies I find interesting are more in the energy and power field as opposed to computers and electronics where that pie chart we looked at showed the uh, larger technology areas being more computer and electronics related, although I think they did lump energy into one of those categories that I was looking at. But these top two applicants are more in the power and energy field. So I'm going to turn this over to Rachel now to talk about patent acquisition in China and due diligence. Thanks, Anne. Um, yeah, look, there, there's kind of three main aspects to to uh, any IP strategy, and uh, the first one is acquisition. So uh, when you file an application into a particular country, uh, you go before an examination board and you hopefully get a patent at the end of it. So 
sorry, I'm just moving the slide. The other element, of course, is enforcement once you have your IP rights, and Greg will talk to that. And then, um, as Anne touched on, due diligence also. Um, a huge number of patents in China, and as such, uh, it would be wise to know what you were going into when you enter into that market. So starting first with acquisition, um, the first thing I'd say is the Chinese um, patent system is very new compared to the US system. In fact, the first iteration was only introduced in 1984, and, and that was quite a big deal. There was uh, much discussion around it because China was growing, and they felt that there was actually a need to be able to copy foreign innovations to, to be able to fuel that growth. But uh, the government took a different path and sent various delegations across the world to study patent systems. and. Uh, it's, it's kind of interesting fact that when they all came back and reported, in fact, it was the German patent system that they deemed to be most suitable for their needs. So when you actually go through uh, the process of filing in China, you'll see uh, a very similar model to that when you're um, prosecuting in, in Europe. So the question I'm often asked is, why should I bother filing in China? I probably can't enforce my rights, and I run the risk of my invention being copied. And you know, I think all of these are reasonable concerns, and, and the answer I give will differ depending upon a client's particular business, their market, and their exposure in China. However, I think for any corporation developing a global IP strategy, China usually figures. The sheer size of the market, for one, is attractive to many businesses. And companies have historically found that manufacturing in China is necessary from a cost perspective. And so some form of protection is definitely desirable. Look, I, I also confess I know some war stories, and I'm sure you all do too. Uh, but generally, the landscape in China is changing. And more emphasis has been put on innovation rather than manufacturing. It's this kind of move, this shift um, pushed by Beijing from made in China to invented in China. And from the figures that Anne's just presented to you, you can definitely see that the Chinese are inventing. And they are using the patent system. So you know, as a result of that, there's a, definitely an evolving understanding and respect of IP rights, and especially in the kind of major centers such as Beijing and Shanghai. So when you're considering China, and, and in fact, this goes for any um, jurisdiction or any market you're entering um, that, that's important to your particular businesses. As I mentioned, the three aspects, acquisition, enforcement, and due diligence. You know. So st starting here with acquisition, you should know what you can and what you can't protect in China. So this chart is, is aiming to show, and I actually replaced US I, this is for my Australian clients. Um, I think we we might need to shrink down the US circle a little bit. The Supreme Court's doing a good job there. But generally, um, US has a broader reach of what constitutes uh, a patentable invention. So in China, you can get patents for mechanical, medical, computer hardware, software, but with a technical feature and uh, chemical inventions. And interestingly, in the first round of the, the first iteration of the Patents Act, pharmaceuticals were actually excluded, but um, the act was amended in the 90s to introduce that. You can't get business methods, but um, we face similar limitations in Australia, and I believe uh, it's the same in the US. And you, a, a key difference is also um, there are no methods of treatment and diagnosis, medical treatment. Uh, which which is similar to most of the world, to be honest. We in Australia can get methods of treatment and you can in the US. But most other countries don't allow this. Um, there have been some very recent guidelines issued regarding business methods and computer programs um, clarifying that, that per se not patentable. 
but with the inclusion of technical features, uh, they will now be examined. So uh, historically, what would happen is any kind of uh, claims to business method or computer programs would just be rejected straight away without examination. And now um, the new guidelines will force an examination for eligibility. So it's seen as a, a bit of a widening of protection for software inventions. So unlike the US, there's two types of patents available in China. The first is an invention patent, which is akin to, to the US standard patent. And it, you'll see there the, the term of that's 20 years. Uh, the second is a lower tier of protection called a utility model. And you might have come across this in some other countries, and particularly Germany. And in fact, Australia has uh, a second tier protection also. I just put something there. Don't forget design applications. We're focusing on patents here. But um, the in the domestic market in China, it's kind of a third, a third, a third. So a third of the filings are invention patents, a third are utility models, and a third are design patents. This slide um, just gives a brief overview of the differences between a utility model and an invention patent. As I mentioned, uh, the invention patent obviously has a longer term of 20 years, whereas the utility model is limited to a 10-year term from filing. The, the nice thing about utility models are you can file them, you can um, if you satisfy the formalities, you will get it issued. However, if you want to enforce that utility model, um, you will need to go back to the um, to the patent office, and you need to um, have it examined. The examination bar is a bit lower, so when they're looking at what's in the prior art and comparing it to that it's generally a bit easier to get uh, a patent for a utility model than it is for the, the bar for the invention patent. Also, a key thing to note is you can only um, protect products, so you can't get methods, um, method claims in a utility model. So moving on to the filing requirements, uh, if you've decided to proceed in in China, it's actually pretty straightforward to get an application filed. And uh, you start with uh, having to obviously translate your specification into Chinese. Typically, you would um, file that the, the translation with your filing documents, but you can, if you need it, get a two-month grace period to file the translation. And just on the point of translations, I, I, I think it's important um, for everyone to understand <laughs> there are translations and there's a, um, translations. You want to ensure you've got a very good quality translator um, you know, going forward. It does add to the expense, but it is important. You are required to file a power of attorney for your attorney in China. And we... Typically, if we're filing from as, as a national phase from a PCT, we'll provide a copy of the search report and the search opinion. And we don't translate that. We would just file that. So the next slide moves on to, once you've got those documents ready, you know, what, what does the process look like? Typically, you would, I'm just going to, the top, the top bar there is for an invention pattern. And the bottom one is for a utility model. You would typically file a priority application in the US. And then after 12 months, you would either file directly into countries of interest to you, or you would file a PCT application. So if you go the PCT route, it's a 30-month country. So you file your application with your translation, your power of attorney into China. And you may request examination at the time of filing. If you don't, there is a three-year limitation um, to actually get that request filed. 
after you request examination, it goes into the queue. And uh, probably five to ten years ago, that was a pretty long queue. The Patent Office has recruited very heavily in the last five years. And um, it, the, the time from requesting examination to first examination is now under two years on average. So you would typically receive a first examination report, and you may be familiar that, with this in uh, other countries, and you get a, a, an opportunity to file a response. This can go back and forth a few times. Again, there has been a shift here historically. Um, you, you would have found that your second exam report could have been a final rejection. That, that doesn't happen so much anymore. And you, you may get two or three or even actually sometimes four. The, the examiners are quite motivated not to issue a rejection. And that's to do with the point system that they've had a change there uh, where they're not so rewarded for issuing a, a final rejection. So you'll find that actually examiners will even phone your attorney and, and they're trying to move and progress the case along. So that, that actually has been a, a quite a fundamental shift in, in dealing with prosecution in China. During the examination, um, like in other countries, you, it will be examined under uh, novelty and inventive step. With novelty, it's key to note that uh, a prior oral disclosure or use outside of China is not considered prior art. And the inventive step is similar to the European inventive step and the US obviousness standards. But again, as I mentioned, for utility models, that test is lower. Uh, the examiner will also consider in there whether the claims are supported by the description of the application or if they actually stretch beyond and claim more than, than is taught by the description. Uh, I would note that the bar is quite high in China on this front, and it's been quite tough for many of our clients in chemistry and biotech, where the patent office is quite prone to restrict the scope of the claims to the particular working examples. So in those fields where possible, it's advisable to include as much data and examples as possible. Also, China, like Europe, has um, relatively strict laws around the types of amendments that you can make to your application during prosecution. And any amendment must be strongly supported by the disclosure in your specification. So this slide's pretty rosy. It's showing that uh, it assumes the application will proceed to grant. And in reality, as we all know, sometimes examiners don't play ball and they decide to refuse the application. So if it is refused, your options at this stage are to either file a divisional application and have another crack at it, uh, hopefully with a more understanding examiner, or you can appeal the decision to the board um, within a three-month period of that rejection. And you can seek a re-examination. And then a panel formed by the board will re-examine the, um, the application. The, this second bar here just shows the, the process for utility. I'll just jump back, actually. The, so the time frame on the invention patents are around three to four years from filing. Utility model, again, you can use your US priority application. And within 12 months, you can, or 30 months, you can file your utility model. If you're wanting to use a dual system and you want to file in China a, a patent in, uh, an invention patent and a utility model. It's important that they're both filed on the same day. So you should be filing a utility model if you want to use that for that invention uh, when you file your PCT or uh, the 12 month stage for your invention patent. And you'll see it's much quicker. It's typically uh, six to 10 months um, from filing to grant. And again, that's because there is not a kind of substantive examination there. It's more um, satisfying formalities requirements. Uh, but if you do want to enforce that further down the track, you will need to go back to the examiner and have it examined. <clears throat> um, 
this is 2012 data. You saw the, the 2015 data. It's, uh, it's pretty clear there's lots of um, patents in China. And if you have gone to the expense to gear up to get ready to enter that market, uh, you might have been, I work a lot in medical devices, you might have got your regulatory approval. Uh, the very last thing you want to do is enter into the market and face a block by a, a patent there. So factor in that it is possible to get sued in China. The sheer vast number would suggest there's, there's plenty of patents to rely on and it has happened. How, how do you address this? I think if you, if you are serious about that as a market for your business, you should be conducting a freedom to operate search. And, and the literature is vast, it's huge, but uh, it's certainly worth doing to avoid any surprises down the track. If you do find um, pertinent patents, then um, there is an opportunity at that stage to request an invalidation before the, the Chinese Patent Office. So kind of knocking them out before you get to the point of there being a real problem. This slide is just to demonstrate again, if you're thinking about an international patent strategy, where does China fit? You know, the market size in the US is huge. For most of my clients in medical devices, that is the key market. Europe, again, a very large market size. Mm, unfortunately, in Australia, we're quite small, but we like to think sophisticated. New Zealand, even smaller. But when we look at China, realistically, the market size is, is very compelling. So. Um, Knowing that the, the, the market's so large, it is definitely worth spending a bit of time and effort looking at how you're going to secure your IP over there. Here we go. Thank you, Rachel. And now, Rachel? Um, yes, that, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Did you have more? I'm sorry. No, I was just going to hand over to Greg. Perfect. Yes, Greg, can you talk about enforcement? I would be happy to. Uh, thank you, Rachel. That was great. Um, yeah, and, and interestingly, how as we walk through this, um, it's it's really interesting to see how enforcement in in China has has changed and and sort of rapidly matured. Um, you know, as as Rachel mentioned, the the entire you know uh, patent system within China is really quite young, uh, particularly in comparison to you know U.S. or or European standards. Um, uh, also, as Rachel mentioned, uh, we'll see as we go through enforcement that uh, that China has, you know, has absolutely uh, modeled their enforcement regime after after Germany, um, where they have a, a bifurcated system, you know, that uh, splits uh, infringement from uh, invalidity determinations. Um, just a, a couple. So, you know, I, I think the first question here, and, and I think Rachel touched on this as well. Um, you know, is sort of why in a patent strategy are we are we talking about enforcement? And you know, I think enforcement is obviously very critical. Um, it's very um, key to determine within any jurisdiction, you know, whether there is a viable enforcement, um, you know, path for for your intellectual property. Uh, and if there's not, you know, obviously that intellectual property has a much lower value. And I think China is an interesting study in that. Um, you know, I think historically, uh, many uh, of us U.S. Pr practitioners, in particular, I think have have operated under the uh, impression, uh, maybe maybe not so much in the recent years, but you know, certainly a, a decade ago, um, that that there wasn't much of an enforcement regime in China, and that it was not something that was, you know, that you were really getting patents, uh, sort of betting on the future. Um, you know, and I'd like to say that I guess um, from what we're seeing and what we're hearing from our foreign associates, that you know the future has really come, and that um, you know patent enforcement is a is a very viable activity within China, and you know it is fast, um, it is relatively low cost, particularly in in view of the U.S., um, and it's a fairly pro patentee um, 
you know, environment, uh, as noted here. Um, you know, it's also an environment where a, a foreign entity can, you know, actually enforce their rights. Um, you know, I think historically China has been thought of as being, you know, fairly, uh, fairly biased to their local uh, businesses and such. And, you know, we're just, the statistics just aren't bearing that out any longer. Um, you know, and then, you know, so sort of stepping back uh, from the basics of enforcement, um, you know, and I move on to the next slide here. Um, so the enforcement system in, in uh, sorry, uh, the enforcement system you know, in China really has a, a couple different venues that you can uh, that you can look to enforce your rights in. Uh, you know these three venues that are shown here uh, are really trying to sort of summarize you know for all of the IP including soft IP and, and criminal enforcement you know realistically is is really you know not something that you're going to look to for patents it's really only applicable to false marking claims. Um, so taking that one off the table you're really looking towards uh, either a judicial, you know, civil court action, which is going to be fairly similar to what you would do in the U.S. or, or Europe, or an administrative action. Um, the interesting aspect of the administrative action is that it can be an extremely fast process. It's very low cost, and you can get an immediate injunction. The obvious downside is that there is no mechanism within the administrative action to uh, sort of enforce or compel, you know, any sort of co you know damages or comp monetary compensation. Um, the administrative bodies all in China also have, you know, a relative inability to handle particularly complex cases. You know, simple um, patent cases, particularly utility models, um, you know, are often enforced through this avenue, from our understanding. Um, but, you know, a, a challenging or, or complex, uh, you know, invention model is probably not the route you're going to take. Um, and, and most of the discussion, you know, following discussion is really going to focus on, you know, civil court action, which, you know, you know, the slide here says unlimited compensation. While I think technically that's probably true in China these days, you know, the, the reality is, is that there is still a statutory, um, you know, damages regime and, you know, the damages on average are probably going to be a fair bit lower than what you would find certainly in the U.S. and, you know, even probably in comparison to the European practice. Um, you know, again, the, the high cost and the time consuming here is really re in reference to administrative actions. If you look at those numbers in comparison to, you know, typical U.S. litigation, uh, the numbers are actually extraordinarily low. So again, as I mentioned at the onset, uh, you know, the enforcement regime in China has, has mod been modeled after the, the, the German model of a bifurcated system. So infringement will be decided uh, you know, in a civil court you know, or if you go through an administrative uh, action, it would be by the administrative body. Um, and then invalidity, if it's, if it's going to be challenged, which it you know, almost certainly will be, um, you know, that is done uh, outside the court case uh, within the, the state intellectual property office. Um, so typical time frame for a court case, um, they can be decided in six to 12 months uh, unless they're stayed, you know, once the court accepts the case. Uh, you know, stays are a possibility in, in China and um, probably becoming more common as, you know, invalidity assertions become more sophisticated. Um, but it is not a guarantee. You know, there is no uh, certainty that you're going to get a stay. The court will look at uh, your inv invalidity petition and will look at the evidence and the arguments uh, presented from the other side uh, to make a determination, you know, as to whether a stay is warranted. Um, but, you know, as in, you know, as in any litigation, um, you know, stays are, are reasonably common, probably becoming more common, and, you know, any sort of delay tactic uh, for the defense is, is you know, probably going to be pursued with some vigor. Um, so in talking about invalidation, uh, invalidation within the, you know, is, is again done within the, the state intellectual property office. Um, 
you know, invalidation rates, um, you know, as, as Rachel mentioned, you know, the utility model is, I guess, considered a, you know, a lower level or lower tier of, of patent. But in reality, once, once you're in, a, in the enforcement context, um, the utility model, other than having, you know, slightly higher invalidity rates within the enforcement regime, the utility model is, is just as powerful as, you know, invention patent uh, once you, you know, have it in a position to enforce. Um, so, you know, don't discount, I guess, is the, is the message there, the, um, the use of and, the, uh, you know, the opportunity to obtain utility models. Um, you know, I know from a U.S. Pr practitioner perspective, it's it's not something that because we don't have an, an analogous, uh, you know, device here in the U.S., I, I think it's something we typically don't think about as often. But um, anyway, something to think about. Uh, getting back to the invalidation uh, timeline, um, you know, the invalidation timeline in China is relatively quick. Um, once you file the petition, you have one month to file evidence uh, and, and basically all of your arguments for invalidity. Um, so advanced preparation is, is quite critical here, um, and especially in, in the view of that um, the, uh, the intellectual property office in China has very strict rules about you know, the evidence and that it must be what, what they would call official evidence. And, and I guess the, the view there, the sort of um, the little bit of a story about how, you know, how stringent this is that, you know, a foreign associate like has, has enjoyed sharing with me is the idea is if, you know, here in the U.S., if we get a, a printed publication, for example, that's come from, you know, some known journal and, you know, it has a publication date and you can go to a library and grab a copy and, um, you know, that's going to be sufficient. Um, in China, that same piece of evidence will, you know, can be made sufficient, but you have to go through some process to, in order to, you know, validate it for the office, which may involve, uh, you know, actually going to a library with a notary and having the notary notarize a copy as the, you know, librarian looks up that, uh, you know, that journal article in the library. So, you know, the official evidence aspect is something where, you know, particularly foreign practitioners, you know, driving, um, you know, an invalidity thing can get tripped up. Uh, so it's something to keep in mind. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that claim amendments are allowed, but they're very restrictive. Um, so they're limited to claim combinations or deletions. You know, you really can't go back to the specification looking for additional features. Um, you know, in reality, this is probably not dissimilar to, you know, the IPR context in, in the U.S. these days where, you know, amendments are certainly going to be limited. You might be able to go to the specification for them, but, you know, it's not a, it's not a wide open field for sure. So, moving on here. There we go. Oh, sorry about that. Damages. Um, you know, I think this is an area where uh, China has seen some, some very interesting developments really in the last seven to eight years. And I think the other thing that's very interesting about um, some of the developments in the damages area is that it corresponds quite interestingly to a lot of the filing and grant statistics where um, this Clint versus Schneider um, case actually got decided in, uh, in 2007, and it was the first really quite large, um, you know, damages determination um, where there was a, you know, 330 million RMB uh, decision against Schneider uh, for, you know, infringement of a, of a patent. Um, you know, it's really the first case in big, first big case in, in China that was very widely publicized where, you know, clearly lost profits came into the, to the, you know, damages compensation. And I think it's interesting how the timing of that case and, and my understanding of the, the wide publicity around that case corresponds very interestingly with, um, you know, resident, um, you know, both filing and, and grant statistics, um, you know, sort of dramatically rising in that 2007 timeframe. 
So, you know, what these recent trends really tell us is that, you know, yes, there is still a statutory damages regime where, um, you know, I don't even know, I guess I don't know statistically whether it's the majority of cases, but I believe that it is still the majority of the cases that are, you know, are receiving, you know, more something in along the lines of statutory damages. Um, but these, these, rec these more recent cases definitely show that uh, with the right evidence and with the right, um, you know, litigation strategy that um, you can, you know, get compensated for your actual losses um, around infringement of uh, intellectual property in China. I think the other interesting thing is that um, I believe it was around the same time frame as the Snyder case, uh, there was a change in the law in China where, you know, attorney fees um, awards, uh, you know, are basically statutory. So, you know, as long as you can, can, can prove your attorney, you know, fees, um, you can recover them as a plaintiff if you win. Um, so I think to wrap up here on the enforcement, um, you know, I think the big takeaways are that, you know, China has become at least statistically a very pro patentee jurisdiction. Um, China offers a, a fairly fast, you know, route to, um, you know, disposition. And, you know, certainly if you're looking for an injunction um, and that's your real goal, um, you know, an administrative action can, you know, potentially get you a, an injunction within six, nine months, not unrealistically. Um, Venue, um, you know, I think certainly from a strategy perspective, um, choosing venue is, is, you know, a real critical decision. Um, I think one interesting aspect of the administrative action is that it does not actually foreclose uh, later enforcement via civil, you know, litigation. So if you want to, you know, seek a quick injunction, you could do that through the administrative action route, and then you'll later still go to court to seek damages. Um, you know, finally, you know, evidence, particularly in the invalidation context, is something to be, um, you know, very mindful of. Well, Ann, uh, why don't we uh, open it up for questions? Great. Um, and actually, before we jump into the questions, I want to remind the audience that you can submit questions using the question button on the right-hand side of your browser. Uh, while we're waiting for to give people a minute to enter questions, I wanted to briefly review what we talked about. So I showed some data that indicates that the number of Chinese applications has increased uh, dramatically and also the grants to Chinese residents has increased dramatically over the last 10 years. I think that reflects the emphasis on innovation in China and the growing recognition of intellectual property in China. and with over 1.5 million invention patents enforced, enforced in China, there's uh, quite a bit of intellectual property there and that's growing. Rachel explained the size of the market in China makes it desirable for foreign companies and with the changing IP environment in China, it's worth considering as part of your IP strategy. One notable difference between the US system and the Chinese system that Rachel explained is the invention model patent, which is a lower tier uh, patent that isn't initially examined, which we really don't have a counterpart to in our U.S. practice. And she also noted that the growing number of patents in force um, is something you should take note of and make sure you do your due diligence before entering the Chinese market to protect yourself. And then Greg talked about the enforcement in China and that in the uh, enforcement in China has rapidly changed and matured. The enforcement procedures are modeled on the German procedures and the process is relatively fast, relatively low cost, and tends to be relatively pro-patent. So with that, uh, we have a couple questions that have been entered. Uh, the first one, Rachel, I'm going to direct this to you. Uh, it's directed to the Australian speaker. The Australian speaker mentioned, the Australian speaker mentioned that for utility model patents, if you want to enforce it, you would have to go back and get a substantive examination. Can you provide more details on what's involved in that high level time, cost, or likelihood of success? Any comments on that, Rachel? Yeah, sure. Um, it kind of goes back into the system like you, you would go through for the invention patent. So it, it's a request for examination that goes to the Chinese examiner it, it's um, 
slightly quicker. It's less than that two years that I suggested for was average for um, invention patents. But it will go through a review on novelty, inventive step, support um, of the claims. But as I mentioned, the bar is a little bit lower there. So what the examiner can reach back to for prior art is slightly more limited. Therefore, the, to answer that likelihood of, of um, getting it granted is higher because of that. But it could still be rejected, uh, in which case it goes into a re-examination system, much like the invention patent. Okay, thanks, Rachel. The second question in the queue is, what kind of evidence can be used in China? Worldwide patents and publications, worldwide products, worldwide product literature and brochures. Um, Rachel, do you have any comment on the scope of, they say evidence, I'm assuming that means prior art. Um, yeah, for the for the prior art, it's any publications and publications around the world. But I I noted that it's slightly different um, process in China is that if you've used, if somebody has used or publicly, um, verbally, orally disclosed an invention outside of China, that that doesn't constitute a prior disclosure, pub, you know, prior art. Oh, that's interesting. That's a that's good to know. Thank you. The next question is, what is the breakdown of resident versus non-resident in success of enforcement? Favorable judgments or orders for residents versus non-residents? Um, any, Greg or Rachel, did either of you have any data on that that broke down enforcement by success for residents versus non-residents? So, um, you know, a couple of the articles that I uncovered for, you know, in preparation for this did have, you know, some statistics on this and, and, and basically within, you know, I think the, the, the article that had the best sort of recent statistics, those statistics suggested that um, there's really only a slight difference in um, success statistics for non-residents versus residents. Um, and, and the article didn't really go here, but you know, based on some other, you know, research and some other, um, you know, thoughts as far as as far as those statistics go, you, you know, part of that statistical difference probably is attributable to um, you know a, a difference in in how strong the patent was to begin with. You know, I, I know, you know, non-residents. You know, if you haven't gotten a great translation, you know, you know, often the the IP is starting from a non, you know, Chinese, you know, reference point where you know on the resident side the the IP is often, you know, just the opposite, and you know the the general wisdom is that that you know has an effect statistically on the strength of the patents. Rachel, anything else to add to that? Yeah, I, I agree with Greg. The the stats I had, they're a little bit old, I think. Um, but for plaintive win rates, it was about 81% for the, the resident, 75% foreigner. Um, defendant's win rate, actually the foreigners, um, the non-residents were doing better with 62%. Um, and the the local 19%. So um, that that data is about five years old, and um, it, it could have changed. But I think I think it's evidence that it's not so skewed against foreigners when you're a plaintiff, and actually foreigners do pretty well in, in the defendant win rate. And Rachel, I think the data that I was looking at was probably relatively similar. I think it was 2012, and the statistics were nearly identical, if I recall correctly, to what you just suggested. Okay. Uh, one additional question. Is there any data for resident government sponsored versus non-sponsored? I have not seen the data broken out that way. Have either of you 
uh, Rachel or Greg? I I have not seen that data. No, I'm not sure whether they published that. So it would be interesting, though. <laughs> mm -hmm. It would. Whether, maybe Greg has seen it. It's none of the none of the articles I I you know I looked at recently anyway you know had any you know, any breakouts that way. But I I agree it would be potentially interesting. Yeah, and I certainly didn't see it in the the filing or the grant data that I looked at, unfortunately. So, uh, but maybe that is something in the future they'll start to track. Well. Uh, today we've talked about the various aspects of patenting in China. Uh, we will post the slides and the audio recording of today's program on the Black Hills IP website. So if you go to our educational materials uh, menu, there's a foreign excellence uh, sub-menu and it will be posted under those. We have um, some contact information here if you're interested in more information about Black Hills IP please contact our Vice President of Sales Jim Brophy if you would like more information about the SLW Institute please contact Brian Ness and then I want to just note the next program in this series will focus on patenting in Japan that will be presented on Thursday November 30th at 1 p.m. Central and you can register for that on the Black Hills IP website as well. So thank you everyone for participating today and Greg and Rachel thank you so much for your insights. I really appreciate it. We hope you will join us for this and future webinars in the Foreign Excellence webinar series. Thank you. <laughs>